Good morning everyone. My topic today is urinary tract diseases with pregnancy. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. And this is my scientific site, dralamusbah.blogspot.com. Let us go to our lecture today. What we want to discuss? Physiological changes with pregnancy as regard the urinary tract, types of urinary tract diseases with pregnancy, like urinary tract infections, renal calculi, renal transplant with pregnancy, chronic dialysis patients and became pregnant, acute kidney injury, and the chronic kidney disease with pregnancy. This is our target today. Let us go. So many physiological changes occur during pregnancy affecting the whole body system. And one of them is the urinary tract system. The cardiovascular system also has many changes. So what are the changes affecting the urinary tract? Increase blood Increase blood volume, increase cardiac output, increase renal blood flow, increase in glomerular filtration rate by more than 50% or around 50%, increase in urea clearance, and increase in relative resistance to vasoconstrictors, increase in levels of nitric oxide and relaxine hormone and there is also increase in urinary stasis and the more susceptibility to infection by the relaxation of the smooth muscle of the bladder and the ureter under the effect of progesterone hormone there is decrease in systemic blood pressure and decrease in systemic vascular resistance and also expected to find in decrease in serum creatinine during pregnancy. So this is some of the physiological changes which occur during pregnancy under the effect of placental hormones also with the increased blood flow to organs. So what are the types of urinary tract diseases with pregnancy we wanted to discuss today? UTI, urinary tract infection with pregnancy, renal calculi with pregnancy, renal transplant with pregnancy, chronic kidney disease with pregnancy, and acute kidney injury, and chronic dialysis patient with pregnancy. So this is our sex topic we wanted to discuss today let us start with the urinary tract infection in pregnancy which is a very common problem affecting the pregnant lady it may be asymptomatic bacteriuria or symptomatic bacteriuria so I have two groups of patients asymptomatic bacteriuria patient has infection but without any symptoms so there is pus cells in the urine and symptomatic patients with pus cells in the urine so what is very important and may be missed from many doctors is the asymptomatic bacteriuria and it is very dangerous one because it precipitates to more hazardous infection like lower urinary tract or upper urinary tract infection also affecting the pregnancy by preterm labor or premature rupture of membrane and so on. So asymptomatic bacteria may be masked and only can be diagnosed if we put this type of urinary tract infection in our mind. So never to mess asymptomatic bacteriuria. The other big group is the symptomatic one. So urinary tract infection is one 
of the most frequent complication during pregnancy. Traditionally, UTI is classified into upper and lower urinary tract infection. A predisposing factor or precursor to urinary tract infection is bacteriuria. So what about the asymptomatic bacteriuria? It's defined as the presence of positive urine culture in an asymptomatic person and occurs in 2 to 7 percent of all pregnancies. Presence of pathogens more than 100,000 colonies of the same species per milli of urine in freshly voided midstream specimen. So, asymptomatic bacteriuria is associated with increased risk of adverse fetal outcomes. In particular, as we said before, return birth and the increased risk of delivering low birth weight infants. That's why it's very important. Also, it may be complicated by more hazardous infection like pyelonephritis. So, what is the clinical management for asymptomatic bacteriuria? Actually, all women should be screened for asymptomatic bacteriuria at the first antenatal, antenatal visit. And this is a message to all obstetricians. You should do screening for asymptomatic bacteriuria for all pregnant ladies with, during the first antenatal visit. By doing urine analysis and the urine culture is very important. Then treat women with positive urine culture with an appropriate antibiotic for the bacteria. Isolate it and the trimester of pregnancy. So the antibiotic should be suitable for this organism and also suitable for the trimester of pregnancy because what is suitable in the second trimester may be not suitable for first trimester or third trimester may be not suitable during first trimester. So it is important to use the proper antibiotics suitable to the pregnant lady. So there are many regimen of drugs by CDC, you can give coamoxiclef 625 mg TDS for 5 to 7 days. Other regimen, Cifroxime 500 mg twice per day for 5 days. So there are many examples for the antibiotics which is suitable during pregnancy. All of them ranging between five to seven days regimen except phosphomycin, which is one single dose of three gram. So, remember that treatment of asymptomatic bacteria is very important. We are protecting the pregnancy and we are protecting from occurrence of more hazardous infection like bailonephritis. So, what are the roots of infections? And your tract may be bloodborne or ascending through the urethra bladder or direct spread from the colon to the right kidney. The pathogens mainly is E. coli, as you can see in this picture. This is the E. coli, constitutes majority of organisms affecting the urinary tract, 85% nearly. Other organisms like Proteus, Klebsiella, Streptococcus, and Pseudomonas. What are the clinical symptoms and signs of urinary tract infection? As we said before, we divide them into two big groups, upper and the lower urinary tract. So, lower urinary tract infection presented by frequency, dysuria, low-grade fever, and suprapubic pain, while the upper urinary tract infection presented by pyrexia, rigors, vomiting, loin pain, dysuria, clinical signs of septic shock sometimes if neglected. So, what is the incidence and risk factors of pyelonephritis? Acute pyelonephritis complicates approximately 1 to 2% of pregnancies. 
The risk factors include previous episodes of myelonephritis, abnormalities in the urinary tract system, congenital anomalies, or stones of the urinary tract, or some medical disease like diabetes or sickle cell disease. All of these are risk factors for myelonephritis. So when you are taking history from your patient, take care about these risk factors because it is important and the incidence of myelonephritis is one to two percent so it is not small incidence it is very important so what are the complications of myelonephritis as we see in these pictures this is a miscarriage of 11 weeks with pregnancy so one of them is the miscarriage and the intratrial fetal death, preterm labor and premature rupture of membrane. All these are complications on pregnancy. What are the maternal complications? Septic shock, pulmonary injury, chronic renal infection. All of them are hazardous really. So I have fetal and maternal complications and both of them are very hazardous. Fetal, like miscarriage, intratrial fetal death, preterm labor, premature rupture of membrane, all of them are hazardous. Maternal, like septic shock, pulmonary injury, or chronic renal infection, and chronic renal impairment. So, what is the laboratory diagnosis? Of course, we said before, we, we should take prophylaxis by management of asymptomatic bacteriuria early in pregnancy with the first antenatal care visit or, or at 12 or 16 weeks gestation. You should do urine culture to detect cases with asymptomatic bacteriuria which may be complicated later on by bilonephritis. So, manage asymptomatic bacteriuria as a prophylactic measure or you do if there is pyelonephritis you should do urine analysis and urine culture by using midstream clean catch specimen urine okay this is the gold standard to do culture and sensitivity test but the problem with the culture only for the result it may take 48 hours to become released so I need a clean catch specimen as we said involves collection of midstream specimen of urine after cleaning of the perineum in order to minimize contamination by scan flora this is very important to instruct your patient about What is the rule of radiological investigations? Really, I, the ultrasound is the most safe investigation during pregnancy. I can use ultrasound for evaluation of the renal tract. Also, any dilatation in pelvic cell system for the character of the kidney, for any stones. So, ultrasound may be very beneficial in some cases of pyelonephritis, especially the recurrent one. What are the predisposing factors for this recurrent or precipitating factors? Maybe urinary stasis due to stones. So, you may need also, beside the urine culture, you may need radiological investigation in the form of ultrasound on the urinary tract. Is there any non pharmacological measures as a prophylaxis for UTI? One study showed a recurrence rate of pyelonephritis approximately 20% and this is a very big incidence of recurrence during the pregnancy or postnatal period. So, a Cochrane review in 2008 of 10 studies showed that cranberry juice does decrease the number of UTI over 12 months. So, cranberry juice Yes, in this study proved that it can protect from urinary tract infection. So, do you know the cranberry, how it looks? This is the cranberry, this is the plant of cranberry, and this is the juice of cranberry. This is very nice. 
you can use it it can protect up to one month what is the pharmacological management of urinary tract infections so we wanted to choose the right drug according to the culture and sensitivity test and take care that this lady is pregnant so not all antibiotics are suitable during pregnancy some antibiotics are completely contraindicated during pregnancy like quinolone you cannot give the patient quinolone during pregnancy because it is hazardous and they can cause anomalies also other drugs are teratogenic so you should use a safe drug so what about the lower urinary tract infection some example of lower urinary tract infection treatment by antibiotics which are safe during pregnancy like co amoxiclav 625 every eight hours for five to seven days another example another example cefaclor 500 milligram for five to seven days or phosphomycin single dose or nitrofurantoin 100 milligram twice daily for seven days so lower urinary tract infection regimen in antibiotics simulating that of asymptomatic bacteria i wanted to treat my patient from five to seven days okay so what is very important is after you finish your treatment and after taking one week rest do urine culture again why to be sure that the urine become clear of infection there is no pus cells there is no any more infection so please don't forget to do this test one week after finishing your treatment what about the upper urinary tract infection which is a pyelonephritis and it is the most hazardous one in infection really CDC also suggests some regimen in antibiotics given also you should do urine culture and the sensitivity test to detect the proper antibiotic and took care to, to use the safe drug as we said we are dealing with a pregnant lady we don't want to use a teratogenic drug so this group third generation kephalosporin is safe during pregnancy actually we can use this regimen like c 3 x one one gram im or iv daily till 48 hours until fever subside then continue by oral drugs like cephalexin 500 milligram every six hours for 10 days so treatment for pyelonephritis continue to to 10 days okay so you should give the patient the proper antibiotic the safe antibiotic and for the suitable duration which is 10 days treatment at least another examples so any antimicrobial prophylaxis for urinary tract infection in pregnancy there is some antimicrobial prophylaxis like nitrofurantoin amoxiclav or cephalexin and it should be considered also in women with the following groups bioluminephritis in in this pregnancy so it is recurrent non renal structure anomaly leading to urinary stasis so there is a risk factors so recurrent urinary tract infections so if Bioluminephritis recurrent or you detect urinary stasis either due to renal stones or urinary sto renal tract stones or structure anomaly so you may need a prophylactic regimen and the safest is nitrofuratoin coamoxiclav or cephalexin as suggested but take care about nitrofuratoin in the last months of pregnancy because it may cause hemolysis of the uh, in the new port so don't give nitrofurantoin the last months of the pregnancy okay okay we finished the first topic which is uti with pregnancy we now we are going to discuss renal calculi with pregnancy the second topic today
Okay, diagnosis and the treatment of renal stones during pregnancy is a real complex problem. Renal stones during pregnancy can lead to significant morbidity for the women and they may also increase the risk of obstetric complication. So, management is a challenging because the optimum diagnostic tests and the treatments are also associated with increased risks for the fetus. So, both the diagnostic tools and the treatment may carry risk for the fetus. So, this is a very complex problem and they need multidisciplinarity. Okay, what is the incidence of renal calculus pregnancy? It is 1 to 1,500. Patients are more likely to be Caucasian and have a history of renal disease and hypertension. So take care about this. The quarter have a history of previous stone disease. While you are taking a history from patient, take care about these points. It's important. Stones appear to be more common in multiparous. So which is more commoner, multiparous or nullibar? Multiparous is more commoner. 80 to 90 percent of stones occurring in second and third trimester more than first trimester so the instance of occurring stones with pregnancy is more in second and third trimester ureteral stones are encountered twice as often as renal calculi so ureteral stone stone in the ureter is more common but than renal stone in the kidney twice time in occurrence what about the right and the left the right and the left are equally affected despite the greater dilatation of the right renal tract so what are the risk factors for renal calculi positive family history take care about this dietary factors those people who are taking much amount of protein and sodium and the less intake of water also the environmental factors like hot climate also underlying medical conditions such as hyperparathyroidism and hypercalcemia what are the clinical presentations in renal calculus pregnancy actually two important presentation flank pain and the hematuria yes flank pain around from 90 to 80 to 100 percent occur in the patients hematuria from 75 to 95 percent so flank pain and the hematuria is the main presentation or, or main presenting symptoms when a stone go down the urethral tract you may find some frequency of maturation and dysuria and suprapubic pain. Also sometimes the presentation may be in the form of written the preterm labor and this is very important. So stone, reunary tract stone may be the cause of written the preterm labor? The answer is yes. So what is the impact of renal stones on pregnancy? A significant increase in risk of recurrent miscarriage, mild preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, gestational diabetes mellitus, caesarean deliveries, and premature rupture of membrane and preterm delivery. What about the diagnosis of renal calculus pregnancy? Laboratory assessment like urine analysis, urine calcium and sensitivity test, CBC kidney function test, serum calcium and investigations for hyperparathyroidism. What about the radiological diagnosis? Ultrasound is the first line investigation used in pregnant women. However, there is a problem with the use of ultrasound, although it is safe. The sensitivity in detection of a stone ranging between 29 to 69 percent but this sensitivity could be increased with the use of transvaginal sonography to detect 
the lower ureteric stools. Also, with the use of color doppler, the insensitivity could be increased. So, using the ultrasound, abdominal and transvaginal, and with, with color doppler may increase the sensitivity in detecting stones. So, ultrasound is completely safe during pregnancy. What about the MRI? Magnetic resonance imaging. It is called also magnetic resonance urography. MRU. This uses electromagnetic radiation rather than ionizing radiation. So it is suggested to be non harmful as regard to the fetus. However, it should be avoided in the first trimester due to limited data on safety during fetal organogenesis. What about CT scanning? It's actually it is harmful, it's very harmful because a large amount of ionizing radiation released from this uh, uh, CT scanning. So exposure of the fetus to this radiation is completely teratogenic. So we are we try to avoid it during pregnancy. What about the limited IVU intravenous urography? It has been proposed but still carry some risks on the fetus, especially during first trimester. So the most safe is the ultrasound. What about the management of renal calculi? I have three lines of treatment, expectant management, medical management, and interventional management. Expectant management, as a rate of spontaneous passage of stone is high, expectant management could be the first line treatment in general population and then during pregnancy, of course. It includes analgesia, hydration, antibiotics for infection, if present. Opioids are generally prescribed to treat acute renal colic because it is very severe pain. Also, paracetamol is safe during pregnancy, but it is not strong analgesic like opioids. Don't use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because it is hazardous to the fetus and may cause renal anomalies, also may cause premature closure of ductus arteriosus in the last two months of pregnancy. So this is the expectant management. What about the medical management? There is no data available on medical expulsive therapy use in pregnancy. However, you can use nefidibam, 20 milligram, could be used safely in pregnancy. And this is tested before in treatment of hypertension with pregnancy and the preterm labor. So we consider nefidibam as a safe drug during pregnancy. So medical management in renal calculi could be by nefidibam. What about the active intervention? Actually, there is instance of 25 to 40 percent of pregnant ladies with renal stones will need active intervention. This is a very, very big incidence. When active intervention is needed during pregnancy, it is imperative to use a multidisciplinary team. Yes, very important to use multidisciplinary team approach with involvement of urologist, obstetricians, anesthetists, radiologists, and the neonatologist. So what is the active intervention? And what is the indications for active intervention? Any patient with obstructed kidney, single kidney, or bilateral obstruction, or stone obstructing transplanted kidney, or recurrent urinary tract infection, or chronic renal impairment may reach into renal failure, or uncontrolled pain and fever and vomiting, or septicemia, or patient at risk of threatened preterm labor. So all these are risk factors and needs very important complications and the needs active intervention 
during pregnancy. You cannot wait. I mean, by this indications, you cannot wait until delivery. You should do interventional treatment. So, what is the interventional treatment? We can divide them into two groups: either temporizing measures or definitive treatment. So, temporizing measures or definitive treatment. The idea in temporizing measure is to release the obstruction. So, you can do PCN, percutaneous nephrostomy, to drain this urine collected and the back pressure which occur on the kidney to release this back pressure. So, you can use PCN or you can insert your retelic stent. Okay? But the definitive treatment is the removal of the stone by urethroscope, as in this picture, urethroscope, removal of the stone, or by percutaneous nephrolysotomy. So here we remove the stone. So the active management or interventional management could be temporizing measures, but like PCM, or your etheric stem or could be definitive treatment using urethroscope to remove the stool or percutaneous nephrolysotomy treatment. Okay, let us go to the third topic today, which is pregnancy after renal transplant. What we wanted to know. Pregnancy is estimated to occur in 12% of transplanted women of childbearing age. And the number of kidney transplant recipients who conceive seems to be increasing. Yes, this incidence is increasing nowadays with much care for a pregnant lady with renal transplant. The incidence of preterm delivery, preterm rupture of membrane, and the fetal growth restriction is high as 60% and should know that. Acute rejection in pregnancy may occur in 9 to 14%. Most women treated with azacyprine and the prednisone, the ectopic pregnancy rate is higher and this is related to adhesions from previous surgery and the peritoneal dialysis. If pregnancy continued beyond the first trimester, 90% has successful outcome. Superimposed preeclampsia and urinary tract infection occur in 40%. So, these women should be managed on case-by-case -case basis between the nephrologist, obstetrician, and the transplant team with the support from clinical microbiology consultant as required. Okay, what about kidney transplanted patients' risk factors in pregnancy? Okay, maternal complications. and fetal complications. Maternal complications include preeclampsia, hypertension, allograft rejection, infections, diabetes during pregnancy, while fetal complications include IUGR, preterm deliveries, miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy. So there is many complications as regard maternal and the fetal sites. What are the criteria for considering pregnancy in renal transplant recipients? The patient will ask you when I, I, I want to be pregnant, when I can start this pregnancy, and you should answer her. Good general health at least two years after transplantation. Absence of other contraindication, of static contraindication. Stable allograft function. Serum creatinine below 2 mg per deciliter. No recent episode of acute rejection. No evidence of ongoing rejection. Normal blood pressure around 140 over 90 millimercury or minimal antihypertensive regimen. So the patient under small dose of antihypertensive because she has mild hypertension or normal tensive. Absence or, or presence of minimal proteinuria should be less than 0 0.5 gram per day. No signs of pelvic calcial distension during the ultrasound. 
recommended immune suppression. We wanted to use as safe drugs as we can, like prednisone less than 15 mg per day, azathioprine less than 2 mg per kilogram per day, cyclosporin or tacrolimus at serabiotic levels according to blood serum level, close drug level monitoring is very important. MMF and the serolimus is very hazardous during pregnancy because it is very teratogenic and you shouldn't give the patient these drugs during pregnancy. Even if the patient planning to be pregnant, you should stop six weeks before give her a chance to be pregnant. So the only drugs which can be given to during pregnancy is prednisone, azathioprine, and tacrolimus. During antenatal cure, close observation is a very important treatment of any infection, asymptomatic bacteriuria or symptomatic one, follow-up of immune suppressive treatment, monitoring renal function by serum creatinine and the creatinine clearance and the urea clearance and the creatinine album ratio. Women should be tested for cytomegalovirus, herpes, simplex, HIV, hepatitis B and C. Those found to be cytomegalovirus negative should have their tips rechecked in each trimester. Take care of this patient taking immune suppressive drug and she is immune compromised patient, either by immune suppressive drugs or by being pregnant. So it is very important to check for these viruses. Oral tolerance test is very important to diagnose gestational diabetes because the patient is at risk of gestational diabetes. Yes. Management of hypertension, you can use alpha missile doba, labetalol, and nifedipine are safe to use in these pregnant ladies. Magnesium sulfate can be used safely in severe preeclampsia. What about labor? And what is the method of delivery? Is it by vaginal or cesarean section? In absence of any obstetric complication, delivery is timed at 38 weeks of gestation. Vaginal pairs is the preferred route. Prostaglandin and centocinone are both safe to use for cervical ripening or induction of labor. The allograft located in the false pelvis doesn't obstruct delivery of the fetus. So this graft is present in the false pelvis, supposed to be. So it will not cause any mechanical obstruction. So if you decide caesarean section, this is for obstetric indication. Or there is pelvic osteodystrophy as regard as a complication of renal failure. So if there is pelvic osteodystrophy, do caesarean section. If there is any obstetric indication for caesarean, do caesarean. Otherwise, you can give her a chance for vaginal delivery and you can, you can use oxytocin for induction or augmentation of labor. Available help from urology, surgical team, or renal transplant surgeons when elective caesarean section is planned. Stress doses of steroid should be administered to women who are on immune suppressive dosage of steroid. Please take care about this point and from the side of anesthesia, they should know, the anesthetist should know about that, that the patient is taking immune suppressive drugs, steroids. What about the breastfeeding? Can we encourage breastfeeding or not in renal transplant to, uh, uh, after delivery? Yes, we can encourage breastfeeding if we didn't change the drugs we mentioned before to be safe during a pregnancy. Okay, so you can, yes, encourage. But if you change it, any drug to MMF, it is very hazardous and you, you should stop breastfeeding. So take care about this. Serolimus is hazardous, MMF, so you should prevent breastfeeding if you shift it to these drugs.
But if you are giving safe drugs as that during a pregnancy, you can encourage breastfeeding. What about contraception? Which is the ideal one? Okay, let us see. Low dose estrogen and the progesterone or progestin only oral contraceptive and renal transplant recipients. If hypertension is well controlled, so I can use COC with low dose estrogen or progestins or, or many pills containing only progestins, especially if she is lactating. Suppose that the blood pressure is controlled, no problem with that. Intrauterine device can be used during after a delivery after six weeks of delivery in patient with renal transplant if used it carry risk of infection because this patient as we said before is immune immune compromised patient so iod the possibility of infection is high so try to avoid it what about the barrier method it is safe yes of course it's safe it is the most safe like condom like local spermicidal so but the you can use it yes but the failure rate is high so if you are using barrier methods or local spermicidal try to use both of them like condom and spermicidal at the same time okay what about tubal ligation tubal ligation yes is one of the most important contraceptive methods especially if the patient completed their family size and extended beyond the age of 40 and uh, has sufficient number of ch living children so you can do tubal ligation what about the pre-pregnancy counseling there must be discussion on the impact of pregnancy on acute rejection and the graft loss, the risk of acute rejection correlate with the pregnancy serum creatinine level as well as the interval between transplant and the pregnancy. So it is important to discuss this point. But fortunately, long-term survival of the graft appears similar in those undertaking pregnancy to those who don't become pregnant. So don't be afraid about the grip as regard the long term survival. It will not be affected as regard the long term survival of the graft. Okay. Let us go to the next topic which is pregnancy in women on chronic dialysis. In 1971, Confortini reported the first successful pregnancy in women who conceived a while on chronic dialysis. There is evidence that the frequency of pregnancy in women on chronic dialysis appear to be increasing, ranging between 1 to 7 percent and maybe increase more nowadays due to much care given to these patients. Okay, the incidence of pregnancy is lower in women on peritoneal dialysis than on hemodialysis. You should know this very well, because peritoneal dialysis, there is adhesions in the, in the abdomen and the pelvis due to peritoneal dialysis. It is suspected, of course. What about the pregnancy outcome? Spontaneous miscarriage is common and occurs in 21% of pregnancies. Preterm delivery is also very common. The mean gestational age at delivery is 32 weeks, so preterm labor is very, very common. Polyhydramnus is very common also, constitutes 42 or to 79% of pregnancies. Maternal complications include hypertension, preeclampsia, hypertensive crisis, anemia, and the placental abruption. Nearly half of these women will be delivered by cesarean section. What is the recommendation for management? As regard protein intake can be increased to 1.5 gram per kilogram per day 
in women on hemodialysis but you should increase in patient on peritoneal dialysis up to 1.8 gram for kilogram per day for each kilogram per day so peritoneal dialysis need need more protein intake weight gain of 0 0.5 kilogram per week can be expected yes fluid intake should be determined individually and you should take care about this fluid input and output the calcium requirement increased to 1.5 gram per day so you should supply calcium during pregnancy we also need measurement of 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels in each trimester and supplementation of uh, if these are found to be low because you are expecting a patient on chronic dialysis to be deficient as regard to vitamin D also the women on dialysis need multiple vitamins like B1, B2, B6, B12 so it should add all these vitamins during pregnancy also don't forget folic acid the patient needs 5 milligram per day and is very important what about the management the frequency of dialysis should ideally be increased to at least 20 hours per week successful pregnancies using a hemodial filtration protocol and the nocturnal hemodialysis the aim is to maintain pre-dialysis blood urea of less than 15 to 20 millimole per liter. Maternal volume depletion and the hypotension should be avoided during the dialysis. And please remember this. I want to not to cause maternal volume depletion and avoid severe hypotension because it is hazardous on pregnancy and the fetus. What about the maternal diastolic blood pressure it should be maintained at between 80 to 90 millimeter mercury so very very important to control the blood pressure especially the diastolic one the amount of bicarbonate and potassium in dialysate should be adjusted based on serum chemistries why to avoid electrolyte imbalance that occur as a result of more frequent dialysis and this is a very important point what about anemia yes it is expected i i wanted to increase the erythropoietin dose given to patient on dialysis by 50 to 100 percent to maintain the hemoglobin between 10 to 11 gram per deciliter also do hematocrit value to detect anemia in addition intravenous iron supplementation may be required to maintain iron saturation at least 30 percent let us go to the next topic which is the fifth one acute kidney injury with pregnancy so until now we finished urinary tract infection with pregnancy renal calculi with pregnancy renal transplant with pregnancy patient on dialysis with pregnancy and now we are discussing the acute kidney injury during pregnancy AKI was defined as increase in serum creatinine by 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours or a 50% increase in serum creatinine from the baseline within 7 days this is according to the kidney disease improving global outcome criteria 2012 okay pregnancy related acute kidney injury in young women worldwide is an important cause of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality sure it's very important rates of acute kidney injury in pregnancy are generally declining worldwide but remain a significant public health concern in developing countries. Yes, the, the incidence of acute kidney injury during pregnancy is decreasing world, especially in developed countries, because of good antenatal care, good replacement of blood loss if there is postpartum hemorrhage, 
good caring for pregnant lady if infection happen. So avoiding septicemia, avoiding blood loss or replacement of the lost blood, that's why the incidence in developed countries decreased. But in developing countries tell the incidence high. So the incidence of pregnancy related AKI decline in developed countries from 1 to 3,000 to 1 to 20,000 in developed countries, which was attributed to the improvement antenatal care, as we said before. What about the developing countries like India and Pakistan? There is some reports from there, the incidence around 0 0.02 to 11.5 percent and this is very high incidence and some countries try to reduce this incidence nowadays by giving a good antenatal care and avoiding the two important risks in developing countries which is the hemorrhage by replacement of blood and infection by giving the proper antibiotics and avoiding the precipitating factors. So, causes of AKI, we can divide them into two groups. In developing countries, there is priority for certain causes. In developed countries, there is priority for certain causes. Let us start with the developing countries. Severe sepsis from septic abortion or chorioamnionitis, hypertensive disorders, and hemorrhage, and partum, postpartum hemorrhage or bleeding in early pregnancy or internal hemorrhage due to ectopic, all these, whatever the hemorrhage early in pregnancy or late or postpartum is a very important cause of AKI. On the other side, develop the countries causes of AKI, hypertensive disorders, sepsis, thrombotic microangiopathy, heart failure, acute fatty liver, and lastly, postpartum hemorrhage. As you can see, postpartum hemorrhage came at the end in developed the countries for proper antenatal and the good antenatal care and the good replacement of any blood loss during a pregnancy or after delivery. So, diagnosis of AKI include history and the clinical examination criteria like increase in serum creatine level of 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours as we mentioned before renal ultrasounds that are obtained to rule out post renal causes of AKI may show hydronephrosis or detecting other problems in the kidney or in the urinary tract serological test to detect any medical disease kidney biopsy is needed sometimes to diagnose the case of kidney problem what about the kidney biopsy the hemodynamic inflammatory and the immunological shifts in pregnancy may unmask underlying kidney disease and this is very important to know about and it can be difficult to diagnose and acute as opposed to chronic kidney injury. Kidney biopsy should be considered in women at least then, at least then 32 weeks of gestation when delivery is not a viable alternative and the treatment may result in prolong prolongation of desired pregnancy. So, Kidney biopsy may be indicated if the patient is less than 32 weeks. I need this biopsy for something urgent, okay? And I can, according to this, the result of this biopsy, I can continue the pregnancy beyond 32 weeks, okay? So it is indicated if the patient before 32 weeks, because if the patient is beyond 32 weeks, I can delay the biopsy after the level. So, 
A systematic review of 39 studies provided data for 243 biopsies performed during pregnancy. The main indication for biopsy was to differentiate between glomerulonephritis and preeclampsia. And imagine what happened. The results lead to changes in therapy in 66% of cases. And this is very important. So, careful discussion of risks and the benefits with the patient, obstetrician, and the neonatologist are needed before proceeding to kidney biopsy. How to prevent AKI? Close observation for early signs of sepsis syndrome or shock in women with balonephritis or septic abortion or chorioamnionitis. Prompt a vigorous replacement of blood in instances of massive hemorrhage such as placental abruption or placenta previa or uterine rupture or postpartum uterine atony. Control of blood pressure and determination of pregnancies complicated by severe preeclampsia or eclampsia because it is very hazardous. And the careful blood replacement if loss is excessive. Avoidance of potent diuretics to treat oliguria before initiating appropriate effort to ensure that cardiac output is adequate for renal perfusion. So you should be sure about renal perfusion before you give potent diuretics. And this is logic. Let us go to the last of our topic today, which is the chronic kidney disease and pregnancy, CKD. The incidence vary from 2 to 12 per 10,000 women. 2 to 12 per 10,000 women. This low incidence may be related to the fact that many women with significant renal insufficiency are beyond child childbearing age, or they may be infertile for different causes, or because of the disease itself. So, women with CKD due to diabetes or autoimmune disease or hypertension are, are at increased risk of adverse maternal and fetal events, including preeclampsia, return labor, low birth weight, deterioration in kidney function, and an increase in overall mortality. So it is very hazardous. A meta-analysis published in 2015 gave us an idea about the maternal adverse events and the fetal adverse events. The maternal complications include deterioration in kidney function, flare of underlying disease, preeclampsia and the help syndrome, complications from immune suppression drugs, and return delivery. On the other side, the fetal complications include stillbirth, neonatal death, return birth, miscarriage, intrauterine growth restriction, and low birth weight. So what is the prognosis of CKD with pregnancy? Actually, women with mild renal impairment do well in pregnancy with few problems. Some little complication may happen. But what is very hazardous is the moderate and the severe kidney dysfunction. So, however, those with moderate to severe kidney dysfunction face the prospect of significant pregnancy-related complication, as well as long-term renal deterioration. So, these women require accurate pre-pregnancy counseling and the expert care during the pregnancy. Take care about the patient with moderate to severe kidney dysfunction. If they become pregnant or if they are planning to be pregnant, you should discuss with them the hazards because it is very dangerous and the chronic renal failure may happen. So maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality is very important and you should discuss this point very well with this patient. So the challenge in pregnancy, 
Women with kidney disorder face several challenges in pregnancy due to increased physiological demands on kidney and risk of disease progression, the potential teratogenicity of medications and the increased risk for complications such as preeclampsia, preterm delivery, and preterm rupture of membrane and enterotrine fetal death and miscarriage. So it is something very challenging to be pregnant while there is chronic kidney disease. That's why the key for achieving optimal outcome in this woman is a multidisciplinary team approach by nephrologist, obstetrician, and intensive care doctor, and hematologist, and microbiology consultant, and all experts in this field of renal impairment is very important. So a multidisciplinary team approach is the ideal solution for chronic kidney disease with pregnancy and the all urinary tract problem, especially the hazardous one, chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury, and patient on dialysis, and the patient uh, with renal transplant kidney. So this is our last slide. We can conclude at the end of this lecture and we covered already the physiological changes with pregnancy and we said many physiological affecting the body system and one of them is the urinary system and the cardiovascular system in the form of increase in cardiac output, increase in blood volume, increase in columnar filtration rate by 50%, increase in creatinine clearance, increase in urea clearance, increase in resistance to vasoconstrictors, increase in relaxin hormone and the nitric oxide, and the decrease in uh, vascular resistance and decrease in systemic blood pressure and decrease in serum creatinine, all these are physiological uh, changes. Then we shift the, to the types of urinary tract disease and we said we have six main topics, urinary tract infections, renal calculi with pregnancy, renal transplant with pregnancy, chronic dialysis patient with pregnancy, and acute kidney injury with pregnancy, and lastly, chronic kidney disease with pregnancy. We covered all these topics, and lastly, this is some references if you wanted to read more about this topic. And lastly, thank you, Professor Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University, and this is my scientific site, dralamusbah.blogspot.com. Thank you, and see you again in another lecture.